Yeah. 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 And when we get started, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40, which, this has survived. <laughs> we, we talked about a couple times now in Isaiah, uh, this idea where they, they uh, a lot of scholars will try and divvy up Isaiah into separate books. Uh, when I brought that up before... I mentioned that, you know, we, we, we don't have to do it for the reasons they're doing it, right? That they're primarily doing it either splitting off 1 through 39 and then 40 through 66 and then sometimes even splitting 40 through 66 into two pieces. So you have Deutero-Isaiah or 2nd Isaiah or Deutero and Trino-Isaiah in this case. They're doing it because uh, typically they're saying, well, the prophecies that are talked about here in 59 through 66, that stuff didn't happen until hundreds of years later. So that part must have been written hundreds of years later. That's why it's a prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, 1 through 39, as we saw, you know, covers the prophecies of Isaiah, and there are these narrative pieces, sort of story, <laughs> where it covered the period from what was called the Syro Ephraimite War through the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, right, through the end of the reign of King Hezekiah. And so that, that whole sort of swath of history, which was, is mostly the last part of the 8th century BC. Around 740 to 7 to 700 BC, roughly, is the part that's covered there. Now, when we get to 40, immediately you'll see 40 just starts with quotation marks in most translations, because there is no, you know, and it was in the third year of the reign of, of King Hezekiah, right? That we saw in 1 through 39. Where I saw this frame every time, you know, when, when Isaiah was first called to prophesy, you know, the year King Isaiah died. Right? I had this vision. We get all these time markers. Well, starting in 40 and going all the way through the end of chapter 66, all the way to the end of the book, which is a pretty big chunk, we don't have any time markers. We don't have any of those time markers. We don't have any of those story pieces. Right? It's just sort of a big prophecy, and then it will say, and the Lord said, and then another prophecy, right? Another prophecy, just one after another without those frames. So there is a difference here, right? It's sort of in the, in the format. And there's a difference we'll see too in a lot of the themes. We saw that we've talked about how prophecy and apocalyptic, what they're really doing is not so much just predicting the future, but they're taking sort of the big picture, right? The big picture from God's perspective, which includes the beginning and the past, the present and the future, right? And showing people that big picture. So whether they're worried about the syro ephraimite war and that invasion, whether they're worried about the Assyrians, whether they're worried about the Babylonians, whether they're worried about being in exile, the prophets come and say, hey, look, this, this is the big picture. Right? Don't forget the big picture. I know things look bad now, but here's, here's what's coming. Here's what God's doing. Right? And in 1 through 39, we saw that a lot of that big picture had to do with judgment. There's judgment coming. And you need to prepare yourself for that judgment. 40 through 66, it's still going to be that, showing the big picture, but sometimes this, this section of the book is called the book of consolation. Because it's going to have sort of the exact opposite emphasis. The emphasis is going to be on God comforting His people. That, that, 
uh, the people in their distress and their fear and their suffering. He's coming to them and showing them the big picture in order to comfort them. This suffering that you're going through now, this fear you have now, this isn't all there is, this isn't going to last forever. There's something else coming on the other side of this for you to have hope. So we can see that there, there is sort of a distinction here. We don't have to separate these a huge amount in time. Because we know that, the, that Isaiah's followers took his prophecies and collected them and saved them. And at some point between then and, and uh, the 500s BC, they were collected into books. Right? So it's very possible that what all these scholars are seeing and what we could see in those examples I just gave is that there were at one point two different collections of Isaiah's prophecies with sort of two different themes put together sort of two different ways and that those two different books were put together into the one book of Isaiah we have now at some point that doesn't mean the same prophet isn't behind both of them necessarily which is what they want to argue but it doesn't mean that they were written far apart in history it just means that there are distinctions there, there are differences, different themes. Right? Just like St. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. <laughs> right? He wrote them to the same people. He wrote them close to the same time. Even. <laughs> but, uh, but they have different themes. They're about different things. They're dealing with different issues. So that said, one more thing before we get started. And that's starting in chapter 42. I'm going to go ahead and do this now rather than stopping and doing another intro after two chapters. Starting in 42, we're going to run into the first of what have been called since the end of the 19th century, the servant songs in Isaiah. And you'll hear them referred to as this. I said, this comes out of the late 19th century, this term, but it's pretty much caught on so that now just about everybody uses it when they talk about this part of Isaiah. And what these are, and I'll, I'll sort of mark them out as we get to them, the first one begins in chapter 42, as I said, are uh, four, <coughs> four songs, because these prophecies are po poetic that we're going to be reading. Four of these poetic prophecies that ref where God refers to his servant. His servant. Uh, his servant in whom he delights. His servant who suffers. And so these, in uh, recent times, have become somewhat hotly contested in terms of what they refer to. Uh, even though they weren't referred to as the servant songs at that time, obviously these passages in Isaiah have been read over the last 2,700 years. <laughs> first, by, first by Jewish rabbinical scholars and then by, by Christians. And uh, pretty much unanimously, until uh, the 19th century, uh, they were interpreted by... Jews and Christians alike as the servant referring to the Messiah. <laughs> as the servant referring to God's Messiah, who he was going to send. Uh, I could go through, you know, it would bore you to tears probably, but I could go through all kinds of Targum and Midrash and <laughs> Jewish stuff, all saying that that uh, the servant in these passages is referring to the Messiah. Right, some of you would go into detail. Uh, rabbi Maimonides, who was, who was a medieval rabbi, so long after Christianity had come into being, wrote this big excursus about how the servant is referring to the Messiah and how you'll know when the Messiah comes because he'll do miracles. <laughs> that will attest to who he is and that he'll come and he'll suffer for the people and all that. And you're sitting there going, did he miss uh, part of the book? <laughs> but he was a rabbi still, so you know. But this is, I mean, this is, so this is even in the medieval period. 
the rabbis are still saying. <laughs> you did. Um, that that this was the uh, that, that this was the Messiah. Starting in the 19th century, I think not coincidentally, around the time the Zionist movement started, it became popular in Jewish circles to say that the servant in these servant songs is Israel. Just talking about the nation of Israel. Israel's son. And, and Israel is the one in, in whom God delights. As we go through, we're going to take a look at that. And we're going to see just reading the text if that makes sense. <laughs> or if the idea is that the Messiah makes more sense. I mean, you could probably already guess which one I think makes more sense. But, but you know. We have, you know, 2,600 years of rabbis and 2,000 years of Christians pretty much all agree this is talking about the Messiah, whether they think that's Jesus or not. I will say this is referring to the Messiah. This recent, it's Israel, I, don't, I think it fundamentally doesn't work. But we'll, we'll see when we get to the... You, you raised a good point when you talked about the medieval rabbi, because one of the things that I really don't understand is how is it that the temple can be destroyed? You cannot sacrifice, you cannot worship. How then do you change gears and go and consider yourself still Jewish? Okay, yeah. that's one. Two, that faith must have some concrete argument or apologetics as to why they think that Jesus is not what would your answer be? Well, I'm not all that qualified to speak for unbelieving Judaism. Uh, <laughs> the Talmud just basically says that Jesus was a phony. The Talmud says? Yeah. It says Jesus was a sorcerer and miracles were fake. Uh, the, the Talmud is the uh, third part of Jesus. Sort of, yeah, it's. The, it's so rabbinic Judaism, in order for there to be a rabbinic Judaism, they had to kind of regroup after the destruction of Jerusalem. First the temple and then Jerusalem by the Romans. Because the, that was the center of their religion. So how do we carry on with the religion? And so there were a series of rabbinical gatherings. And they put together what's called the Talmud. Uh, which is a collection of rabbinical sayings and interpretations and traditions uh, that basically put together what we now call rabbinic, the religion we now call rabbinical Judaism. You know, how do you observe Passover now that there's not a Jerusalem? <laughs> right? How do you observe, you know, and so the modern practices surrounding how they celebrate Passover in an Orthodox Jewish synagogue, community, the synagogue services themselves, uh, the, the other holidays, the way they celebrate the Feast of Booze, Hanukkah, etc., etc., etc. Yom Kippur, now that there are no sacrifices, <laughs> you know, how do you celebrate? All of that comes out of the Talmud. And so, what the Talmud has to say about Jesus is just a few things. Number one, he was a phony, he was a sorcerer, his miracles were fake. Uh, number two, there was no virgin birth, he was the illegitimate son of a Roman soldier. Uh, they don't like to bring that up because it's, it's very dogmatic, very anti-Christian. And they wrote it at a time where they still had more power than Christians. Uh, so for most of history since then, Jews have been a minority in most of the world. <laughs> you know, they've been persecuted legitimately. But it was written in a period where sort of the shoe was on the other foot. And so it's very anti-Christian, very shocking when Christians read it. Today. Yeah. Today. They don't, and so they don't like to talk about that stuff today, but it's all in there. Um, so that, I mean, that's the basics of their answer is just that they say Jesus just wasn't him. He was a phony Messiah. Uh, now they don't like, like I said, they don't like to refer to the Talmud now. Now they try to be more friendly about it. They try to say, well, Jesus was a great man. He was a good Jewish teacher. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. We just don't believe he was the Messiah. 
<laughs> you know, they're, they're kind of being nice, you know. Yeah, yeah it's nice to be nice, but... <laughs> but that's not, the, you know, the original was, as far as they were concerned, he was a fraud, and the, and the, 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 the Talmud outright takes credit for killing him, too, which was another part they don't like. <laughs> Talmud says they were justified in having him killed because he was a phony. Right? He was a phony Messiah, so they rightly... So therefore, is this the problem that you have in Europe with anti-Semitic is because it's... It was part of it, yeah. Part of it came back. And still they are. Europe is very... Yeah. Yeah, that was part of it. And, and part of it was um, ironically, the same thing that got Christians persecuted. It was the same kind of the, the the Europeans held on to the same kind of superstitious thinking that Rome had. So Rome, you know, whenever anything bad would happen, right? Well, why did this bad thing happen? Well, the gods must be mad at us. Well, why would the gods be mad at us? Who hasn't been worshiping the gods and giving sacrifices to the gods? Oh, those Christians—they don't give any sacrifices to the gods. That must be why they're angry, <laughs> right? Well, let's go wipe out the Christians and then maybe they'll be happy. Europeans did the same thing to the Jew. That something bad would happen, a disease outbreak, war would turn bad, natural disaster. They'd say, oh, why did God let this happen to us? Why is God mad at us? Those Jews aren't worshiping Jesus. They reject his son. That must be why God's mad at us. And so they'd go and, <laughs> they'd go and, they'd go and attack the Jews. And obviously... We don't believe that. <laughs> the, the, I mean, everything we've been reading. Let's let's take it out of this context and go back to the you know what we've been reading back in Isaiah. You know, God's talking about nations like the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ethiopians, who are all completely pagan at this point. They're worshiping idols. They're sacrificing animals to false gods. In some cases, sacrificing their children to false gods. Right. And God's saying, I love them, they're still my people, and I'm going to lead them back to the truth, right? He's not saying, go wipe them out, right? In the prophets we've been reading. He's talking about how he's going to bring them and reconcile them to himself. So if that's God's perspective on outright pagans who are doing these horrible things, I mean, our attitude towards the Jews who are sort of almost there, right? It's like, come on, guys, you know? get on board ought to be that much more and we'll talk more about that when we get into Romans because <laughs> St. Paul talks about it in Romans because he's caught smack in the middle of that as a Jewish rabbi sitting there looking at his brother Jews saying why can't you see this <laughs> Jesus is our Messiah why can't you smack back you know why can't you see it and this is Paul's argument all yeah. The yeah yeah I'm looking at that even Paul's uh saying, you know, look, look, I was a good Jew. Right. But his goal is, come on, guys. <laughs> right? We need to come back. You need to come back to, you know. And it's hoping then, that the, see, the Gentiles coming into the church will make him jealous, and maybe that'll get him to come back. You know, the Gentiles are not worshiping your God. <laughs> you know, why don't you come back and worship your God? So how many, there's still a young To sort of create rabbinical Judaism. Okay. And it's not even What's now called the, the, the town. Right? What we did, you go in and bought a copy. That one the town. What's the name? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what is it about? Multi volume. <laughs> yeah. Could but you? that final form was compiled just before 600. So it's sort of, there's sort of a parallel development going on there with our church fathers. Right? Our church fathers are, are coming to understand and expose itself a Christian faith. You know, we get the nice and free, we get the, you know, at the same time, the rabbis are sort of <laughs> figuring out, setting out what rabbinical duty is. It's, it's like the, the, the third the book that they go by. Yeah. yeah. The Torah, they, Mishnu, and then the Kabbalah. Yeah. So those are three books that they use. Yeah. We as Christians, what the books that we use, Old and New Testament. Right. 
contribution. And so that's, that's what forms. Because coming out of the Old Testament, the Old Testament religion comes to, a, to an end. I mean, you, yeah. there's no temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> and, then, and then 50 years later, there's no Jerusalem. Don't know that second part, but after Titus came in and wiped out, wiped out the temple, flattened it. They came in. in the, there was another Jewish rebellion, and in 112, the Romans came back in and wiped Jerusalem off the map, the whole city. And they built another city on top. Of it. They brought in earth and plowed everything under. They built another city. That city was called Alia Capitolina. And it was the city of Alia Capitolina stood there until Constantine. Until Constantine. Um, and even after that, if you read the Acts of the first couple of ecumenical councils in the church, when they refer to Jerusalem, they don't say Jerusalem, they refer to it as Alien. They refer to the who we would call the patriarch of Jerusalem as the Bishop of Alien. <laughs> because it's still they wiped out and so what they did when they came and wiped it out was they not only wiped out all the holy sites that were left and plowed them under both Jewish and Christian because at that point they didn't distinguish <laughs> right especially the Romans didn't distinguish but they built pagan temples on top of all the Jewish and Christian holy sites so they built a temple to Zeus where the temple had been. the temple in Jerusalem they built all those pagan temples, there was a temple of Venus of Aphrodite on top of what's now the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that's how when we read about how St. Helena, Constantine's mother, went and found all these sites and you're like, well how could she have found all these sites? Right? It's 300 years later. How could she have found them? Well, because she had the Roman records of what stuff was built on top of it. Yeah. She had a blueprint. <laughs> right? They, the reason she was able to find the cross yeah. and find where Golgotha was and find where the tomb was was that they had built a temple of Venus on top of it in 112 and so she went back and they tore down the temple of Venus and excavated under it and that's where she found the cross they had to go down yeah. <laughs> they excavated under it that's where she found the cross that's where they found the tomb that's where they found Golgotha all the things that are in the church of the Holy Sepulchre now and they built the church of the Holy Sepulchre on that site right? and they tore down they didn't build anything on the temple now, but they tore down the temple of Zeus that was there. Right? Once Constantine became a, the Muslims built a, became a Christian, and then when the Muslims came in and conquered it, they later built the, the uh, Dome of the Rock there. But so that's how they knew where all these places were. <laughs> the upper room where Christ had the Last Supper and all these things, you know, these traditional sites, you're like, how did they still know after 300 years? Because the Romans built stuff there. <laughs> right? And they knew what was built where. The Romans kept good records. Yes, the Romans kept very good records <laughs> of all those things. But so all that is to say, that second part, there was no Jerusalem. Well, if you're Jewish and you're not a Christian, you didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, you're trying to carry on as a Jew now. What do you do? What have you got? Well, you've got what we call the Old Testament books. But when you look at how they tell you to worship, it's all direct sacrifices in the temple. Jerusalem? No temple. No <laughs> sacrifices. No Jerusalem. No Jerusalem. <laughs> you can't go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, there's no Jerusalem. Right? And they banned the Jews from even entering the city. Of Alien, Cavalier. Can't go on a pilgrimage. <laughs> right? Can't go. So they had to completely fall back and regroup. And that's that's where the, the Targum starts to develop. That's where the rabbis start to say, okay, well, what parts of the Torah can we still keep? Well, we can still keep the dietary stuff we can keep. Well, what do we do for Yom Kippur? Well, I guess we'll have to pray and repent now? <laughs> you know? I mean, there's, it's, 
<laughs> so, I mean, You're making it up as they go. <laughs> sort of, sort of. <laughs> you know, trying to keep as close to the original as they can, but they couldn't keep that close. And, of course, the Christians, this is why you read, uh, like, uh, St. Justin Martyr in the first century's dialogue with Trifo and the Jew, the first thing he points out is he says, you guys don't have a temple anymore. <laughs> we don't have a leg to say it Right? We don't need a temple because we have Christ, right? We, we understand why the temple's gone. <laughs> they only had one, like, they didn't have one synagogue like they have now. Well, they had synagogues, but you can't sacrifice animals at them. Only in the temple. Only in the temple in Jerusalem. And so synagogues were sort of something they had already made up <laughs> as, a, as a way to, to deal with the fact that now you had Jews living 500, 600, 3,000 miles from Jerusalem. And they're like, well, I live 3,000 miles from Jerusalem. I can't go and sacrifice at the temple, so what do I do? That's where they came up with synagogues. Well, gather with the other Jewish people and read the scriptures and pray. <laughs> because that's all you could do. You couldn't go and sacrifice. And so, yeah, they, they had to completely re, recreate the other. And it's important to remember that. Because a lot, one of the big mistakes a lot of people make reading the Old Testament is they read the Old Testament as if the people of the Old Testament were modern rabbinical Jews, <laughs> which they aren't. It's a completely different religion. And the, the, the argument between Christians and Jews is over which one of us is really the continuation of that religion in the Old Testament. Christians say it's us. We're the continuation of that religion in the Old Testament. Rabbinical Jews say it's, that they're the continuation of the religion in the Old Testament. But that's the, and I've been I've been saying that for years, and I was greatly heartened that I heard Rabbi Jim Cohn say, <laughs> instead of talking to me about Judaism, I said, okay, good. The rabbi agrees with me. <laughs> he said that that's the debate between Christians and Jews oh. is over which one is the continuation of the Old Testament <laughs> of the Old Testament religion. Um, Well, yeah, there are there are practical things that happen, and just and just pragmatic things, and it's important that we recognize those for what they are. Right, that those are those are pragmatic things that happen at a at a particular time. But so so that all that is getting back to <laughs> this very modern idea that Israel itself. Right? Because rabbinical Judaism now has distanced itself even from the idea that there is a Messiah. Right? They wanted to get past that because I've, I've heard rabbis and it's like, well, that makes it sound like our religion is incomplete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or this idea. So, <laughs> trying to then redefine, well, it's just about, it's just about us as a people. Us as an ethnic people. In the church, we have aspects of both. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so extra long introduction done. <laughs> so was a great oh, yeah. Good job. We'll get here and do uh, <laughs> chapter forty. Okay, and then, as I said, the first of these servants on. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get here into chapter forty-two. So chapter 40, as I said, just begins with quotation marks. We don't have any setting. But. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says God. O priest, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Comfort her, for her humiliation is ended. Her sin is pardoned, for she received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths of our God. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill humbled. And crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places into plains. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. For the Lord has spoken. Does anybody remember hearing any of that earlier today? Yes. 
<laughs> Good that I read clearly. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is the passage that we just heard quoted at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark earlier today in liturgy. And the passage by every valley shall be exalted. Well, that's the right. Every mountain and hill humbled. So this passage is taken uh, is taken to be about the end of the exile okay. the end of the exile that the, God's people should be comforted because there's this road being made in the wilderness God's making this straight path so that they can all come back to Jerusalem okay. that's how it's that's how it's typically interpreted we read Ezra, first, second, third Ezra we read Nehemiah does this sound anything like what happened when they came back from the exile? When some of them came back from the exile? <laughs> we saw there was like a trickle, right? A lot of them stayed in Babylon. And there were some who stayed in Egypt. There was this trickle that came back. They kept getting attacked. Remember? <laughs> when they were building the wall, they had to kind of stand in the hole in the wall with the sword and lay brick with one hand and... <laughs> Fight them, fight them off with the other yeah right and did and at that time did all flesh all flesh it actually is inclusive not only of the human race it includes animals did all flesh see the glory of god <laughs> when they came back and were out there even no right one of the one of the basic things we're going to see when we get into the new testament which we probably will by the end of the year but, and which we saw this morning right at the beginning of Mark's gospel is this idea that the exile at the time that Christ is born on this earth the exile isn't really over the exile hasn't really ended and that's an idea that's not just in the New Testament that's an idea that most of the Pharisees for example believe the same thing they didn't accept Herod's temple as being legitimate because right? remember we read in the Maccabees about how that order of priests got founded. Were they Levites? No. No. <laughs> right? They're the, they're the, the king made his brother the high priest. Right? <laughs> they, they had no connection at all to the priesthood. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. The, they didn't have a legitimate priesthood in terms of, in terms of what, what we're told in the, in the Torah. It wasn't it wasn't rebuilt to spec, right? It was just built according to Herod's imagination. They actually patterned it after pagan temples. Well, at the same time, you mean there's still Jews when Jesus is there? There's still Jews coming back. There's still well, remember at Pentecost, right? Feast of Pentecost. Yes. The apostles go out. Yeah. And they preach to people from all those countries. Well, our people from all those countries in Jerusalem, they're Jews who came there for the peace. For the peace of Tabernacles. So there's Jews scattered all over the world. There's Jews in Rome at Jesus' time, in the city of Rome. There's Jews in North Africa. There's Jews in, in the East, in Persia. Right? They're all over the place. That was the great dispersion, wasn't it? Uh, it was the uh, Roman Emperor also that really scattered it, even the Christians right now. Well, he, it, there were several expulsions of the Jews from Rome. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but, so they were scattered, they were scattered everywhere, right? But yeah, they hadn't all come together and all come through <laughs> back to Jerusalem. Right? But what happens? What happened at the beginning of Mark's gospel? Right? Say John the Forerunner shows up. Who's he? He's the son of the legitimate high priest, right? The one who they murdered, who actually was descended from Levi. Okay, and he's out in the wilderness, <laughs> right? Crying out, "Make straight the way of the Lord." Well, how's he doing that? How is he leading the people back in? Well, how did the people come in the first time, back in Joshua? 
Back in Joshua, when the people came in, they came up to the Jordan River and they parted. They parted, and they came back in through the Jordan. That's how they came in and, and received the promise of it. Right. So, St. John, the forerunners, bringing them out into the desert and doing what? Baptizing. Baptizing them in the Jordan River. He's taking them through the river. And why is he baptizing? Verse 2. O priests, remember who St. John the Forerunner is, speak to the heart of Jerusalem, comfort her, for humiliation has ended, her sin is pardoned. Right? He's out there preaching baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Right? So he's the priest who's out there proclaiming to Jerusalem, all the people are coming out of Jerusalem to see him, to Jerusalem. Forgiveness of sins is here. Right, we're coming back in. If you come tomorrow night, commercial for theophany, right, for Christ's baptism, which is what this is leading up to in Mark, right, Christ goes through the Jordan first. Right, and we'll read, when we, when we go through the Gospel of Mark, in particular, the Gospel of Mark has a lot of parallels with God. Where sort of Christ is coming and taking back the promised land, ending in, ending in Jerusalem. But you'll hear in the hymns for Theophany, you'll hear all these references to the Jordan, you know, the Jordan saw and turned back, or the Jordan parted. And you think, there's nothing about the Jordan parting when Jesus was baptized. <laughs> That's not the story. That's because coming here and going back to Joshua. Right? The symbolism of what's happened. Right? That God is finally ending the exile. And not just the exile of Israel from their country, but again, anytime we're talking about exile, we're primarily talking about the original exile, which is in Genesis 3. When we as human beings, that's why it's proclaimed to all flesh, because we as human beings an exile from paradise. And now Christ is leading the way back. So that's what this is, that's what this is aimed at, and that's what St. Mark was getting at this morning by quoting this passage. Right? He's saying, this, you know, this is now finally being fulfilled. Now finally that the Messiah is here. Right? Now you hear the priest in the wilderness crying out to Jerusalem, look, forgiveness of sins has come. And now Christ is coming to lead us back through the Jordan, through baptism, to take back, to take back the land and back into paradise. So that's just 40, 41 through 5 right there. As you see in uh, 6, it sort of changes gears a little. The voice said, cry out. So I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all man's glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. O you who bring good tidings to Zion, go into the high mountains. O you who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord is coming with strength and His arm is with authority. Behold, His reward is with Him and His work before Him. He will feed His flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs with His arm. And He will comfort those with young. Now remember, one other thing to keep in mind, right? Well, we'll talk about this more as we get into the New Testament, is that, as we've said before, the chapters and verses in the Bible are very late edition. Those are very recent. And so, in the past, when you read the Church Fathers, or when you read the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament, right, what you see is, in order to quote, they give you the first line. Right? They say, as it is written, right, they tell you the first line. But what they're not just saying... As it is written, this one sentence. 
We've talked about this a few other times with other with other prophecies, like when we talked about a virgin shall be a child. It's not just referring you back to that one sentence or that one verse. It's a, it's referring you back to that text because they don't have a chapter or verse. They can't say, "Go look up Isaiah 45 and 46 and read them." <laughs> there is no chapter division. So they say, as it is written. They give you a sentence and they expect you to then go back to Isaiah, start with that and sentence and read. <laughs> read. So, St. Mark isn't just referring us to that piece he quotes, but to this whole, to this whole section. And part of the way you can see that is, verse 9, O you who bring good tidings to Zion. What's translating good tidings there is gospel. You who bring the gospel to Zion. And if you remember the very beginning of St. Mark's gospel, the first sentence is the beginning of the gospel of God. So even before he actually quotes Isaiah, he's actually referring to this passage. So what is he crying out, crying out in the wilderness? First piece it's about judgment. St. John the Forerunner says, All flesh is his grass. Right? All the things of this world, judgment is coming. St. John the Forerunner talks about fire. He talks about the axe being at the root of the tree. Right? But the word of the Lord endures forever. But then on the other side, behold, the Lord is coming. The end of the gospel we read this morning, St. John said, One is coming who is greater than I, whose sandal I am not fit. To untie. Well, that's the Lord is coming with strength, and His arm with, is with authority. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His work before Him. He'll feed His flock like a shepherd, gather the lamb. That's Christ. Right? St. John's pointing to, with His voice is pointing to, again, coming out of the wilderness. Verse 12, who measured the water in his hand and heaven with a span and all the earth with a handful? Who weighed the mountains in scales and the veils in a balance? Who knows the Lord's mind and who is his counsel or who advises him? Or with whom does he take counsel? Who instructs him and who teaches him judgment and shows him the way of understanding? The nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the balance of a scale and they are counted as spittle. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn nor its four-footed animals sufficient for a whole burnt offering. All nations are as nothing, and are counted as nothing. To whom then will you liken the Lord, and to what likeness will you compare him? Has the workman made an image, or has the goldsmith overspread it with gold, gilding it, making a likeness of him? For the workman chooses wood that will not rot, and skillfully seeks to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Will you not know, will you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Do you not know the foundations of the earth? It is he who possesses the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It is he who stretches out heaven like a vault and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He makes the rulers he establishes to rule to, to be as nothing. He makes the earth as nothing. Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he shall also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. Now then, to whom will you liken me that I should be exalted, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who displayed these things, he who brings forth their host by number, he who calls them all by name. From the greatness of his glory to the strength of his might, nothing escapes your notice. So what is this all about? Well, this is about idolatry. Right? He's saying, if you were going to try and make something to represent God, Right. That's why he's saying Lebanon doesn't have enough wood. Right? There's not enough wood in all of Lebanon. You know, the cedars of Lebanon. Right? You might say there's not enough wood in Sequoia National Forest. <laughs> right? Even if you chopped that whole thing down, you wouldn't have enough wood to make something like God. So he's saying, you know, how can you use a wood? I mean, God made everything in the world, so you can't take something in the world and use it to represent God. Right? Make God. Right. He's saying, you know, God makes, and even his rulers, right, they like to set themselves up as, as gods. Right? He makes them seem like God. He makes them seem like grasshoppers compared to him, right? They're little bugs. 
There's nothing to which you can compare God. Why is there this bit about idolatry all of a sudden? Well, we call the feast we're celebrating tomorrow theophany. Right? What does theophany mean? We talked about this before, but theophany comes from two words. Theos, obviously, is God. Right? And this is the Greek word, uh, verb phaneo, which means to appear, to be manifest. We talked before, back when we were in 1 Maccabees, uh, the, the Syrian emperor, the Greek Syrian emperor, Antiochus Epiphanes is what he named himself. Right? Epiphanes meaning the appearance that he was the manifestation of God on earth. Well, this is literally theophany, the manifestation of God on earth. Right? And not just Christ, right? but in the Treparian of theophany, right? it's the Trinity that's made manifest. It's the Trinity that appears and reveals themselves clearly for the first time. Right? The three verses in the Trinity. Because Christ goes into and comes up out of the water. Right? The voice of his Father speaks to the old and new loved Son, whom I well please. And the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descends from heaven upon him. So the Holy Trinity is manifest here. Well, what does the manifestation of the one true God mean? It means an end to idolatry. Because right? after the one true God, living God, the Holy Trinity has manifested himself in the world. Right? Are you going to go back to worshiping your <laughs> little idol? That you worked really hard to make sure it wouldn't wobble? <laughs> That's the, the tottering part. Right? You were real hard, made sure you got good wood. You got it real flat so it wouldn't wobble and fall off the shelf. Right? Are you, is there any way you can go? No, the God who created the heavens and the earth has manifested himself in our world. Right here in the Jordan River. And so now, idols are done. Idols are done. Verse 27, For why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, saying, My way is hidden from God, and my God took away my judgment and departed. So then, have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the God who created the ends of the earth, neither hungers nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the hungry and sorrow to those who do not grieve. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the elect shall be without strength. But those who wait on God shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not hunger. No, I reset it. <laughs> It'll buy us time. It'll start beeping again in a while, but we bought some time. Uh, so here, in the passage, you see basically the core of what a lot of what Christ's message is going to be. Right? What does Christ say over and over again? Many who are last shall be first, and many who are first shall be last. Right? He fills the hungry, and those who do not grieve, he brings sorrow. Right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In St. Luke, you, know, you get the opposite of the Beatitudes, you get the woes. <laughs> We've talked about woes. <laughs> Woe to you who laugh now. This core, that, that there's going to be, that this visit that's being prophesied here, that St. Mark is telling us, happens when Christ appears to us in the Jordan River, be baptized by John. This visit, this is God visiting his people, and there's going to be this reckoning. A lot of the people who at that time were on top, or so they thought, in terms of this world were on top, are going to end up on the bottom when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. 
And a lot of the people who are on the bottom now in this world, you know, who, who the, uh, the high and mighty and the religious wouldn't even touch are going to end up being the first in the kingdom of heaven. So this, this what's now a chapter, right, predicts this particular time and this particular event. St. Mark tells us exactly when this happened and when this was fulfilled. So now chapter 41. Be renewed before me, O coastlands, for the rulers will gain their strength. Let them come near and speak together. Then let them declare judgment. Who raised up righteousness from the east and called it to his feet that it should go forth? He will establish it before the Gentiles and amaze kings. He shall bury their swords in the earth and cast away their bows as sticks. He will pursue them and the way of his feet will pass through in peace. Who worked and performed these things? He called righteousness. He who calls it from generations of old. I, God, am the first and into the future I am. The Gentiles saw his righteousness and feared. The ends of the earth drew near and came together. Each one judging for his neighbor that he might help his brother. One will say the craftsman is strong as is the metal worker who strikes with the hammer and forges at the same time. Sometimes one will say it is put together well and they fastened it with nails. They arranged them and they shall not be moved. But you, O Israel, are my servant, and Jacob whom I chose, the seed of Abraham whom I love. I took you from the ends of the earth and called you from its height. I said to you, you are my servant, I chose you and have not forsaken you. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not go astray, for I am your God who strengthens you. And I will help and secure you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all your adversaries shall be put to shame and disgrace, for they shall be as though they did not exist, and all who oppose you shall perish. You shall seek but not find the men who rage against you. For those who war against you shall be as though they did not exist. For I am your God who holds your right hand, saying to you, Fear not. O Jacob, O Israel, few in number, I will help you and I will redeem you, O Israel, says God. Behold, I will make you like new saw-shaped threshing wheels of a wagon. You shall thresh the mountains and beat the hills to powder and make them like chaff. You shall crush them and the wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind will scatter them. But you shall be glad among the saints, O Israel. The poor and needy shall rejoice exceedingly, for when they seek, shall seek water, but there is none, and their tongues are parched with thirst, I, the Lord God, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. But I will open rivers in the mountains and fountains in the midst of the plains. I will make the desert into marsh meadows and the dry land into aqueducts. I will plant the cedar, the box tree, the myrtle, the cypress, and the white poplar in the waterless ground. So they may see, know, consider, and understand together that the Lord's hand did all these things, and the Holy One of Israel created them. Okay, so continuing, continuing from this, right? what are the what are the steps that are going to what are the things that are going to happen when God appears? Right, so we've got many who are high will be laid low, many who are low will be exalted. Right? Now this O Coastlands, this is actually if you back to the Hebrew, that's actually the islands again that we talked about before. They sort of represent the far ends of the earth. So in this first part we're talking about the Gentiles, the nations to the far ends of the earth. Right? So the Lord's going to come. He's going to come to lead Israel back from the exile. He's also going to manifest himself to what? To all the nations. To the ends of the earth. And that's piece number two. He's going to go, he's going to extend his periods to all the ends of the earth and to, right, remember verse 14 of chapter 41, Jacob, Israel, few in number. Right? This is that remnant. This remnant of Israel that's left. It's left over that we've seen over so he comes, he strengthens this remnant of Israel, right, and restores them, and he manifests himself to all the nations. This is what St. Paul is going to go on to talk about in Romans. And this is a piece, this is a piece where, again, if you want to try to interpret 
chapter 40 that we've interpreted as being about Christ. If you want to go back and try and interpret that very vaguely and say, well, that's, that's just a really poetic description of the end of the exile and him coming back to Jerusalem. Well, then what's this? <laughs> right? What's this? Did they manifest their strength to all the nations of the world? I don't remember that. I remember them, remember them getting conquered again really quickly. Right. Did they have as God of the whole world? Was that tiny remnant strengthened? Right? And restored? And turned into this beautiful... The image... The image, right? It's talking about planting all these trees. Right? Planting all these trees. That's referring us back to... Genesis. What did God do for man originally? He planted a garden. Right? Let's talk about restoring paradise. Restoring paradise with this remnant and with the nations. Did that happen? No. <laughs> Not if this is just talking about. Right? So, this is the second piece of what happens when Messiah, when Christ comes. Because his glory the gospel goes out to all the nations and restores that remnant. Okay. Well, how do we end up when Christ comes, as we've seen before, and the other prophets, when the Messiah comes and he comes to Israel? Why do we have a remnant, only a remnant left? Because when he comes, there's a judgment of the people of Israel. Right? As judgment of the people of Israel, many of them are cut off, many of them are judged, but there's a remnant that comes through that, right? That's sort of focused like gold. So what should we be expecting to read in the next sentence or so? Verse 21. Your judgment draws near, says the Lord God. Your counsels draw near, says the king of Jacob. Let them draw near and tell you what will happen or tell you about the former things, what they were. Who's the them there? The them there is the is the idols. We're going back to the idols, right? Let them tell us. Let them tell you about the things that were in the past. Right? He says, I gave you the Torah. I told you how the world how I created the world. I told you about the things that happened in the past with your ancestors. Let's see, what do the idols have to say? Right? About what happened in the past. Or tell you what will happen in the future. Tell you about the former things, what they were. We shall be able to understand and know them and know what are the last things. And tell us about the future. Oh, how's it all going to end up? All right? Let's ask them. Verse 23. Declare to us things coming at the end of time, and we will know you are gods. Do good and evil, and we shall marvel and see it together. Where do you come from? Where does your work come from? They chose you an abomination out of the earth. I raised up one from the north and from the rising of the sun, and they shall be called by, that, by my name. Let the rulers come, and you will be trampled down, as potter's clay and as a potter tramples down the clay. That's important. In verse 25 there, remember when we get to the book of Romans, and St. Paul is talking about this in Israel, talking about with the judgment that's come on Israel and Christ, how many have been cut off, this is the exact example he uses. Right? It says, who is the potter? Who is the clay to say back to the potter? Right? Why, did, why did you make me this way? Why did you, why did you choose for this to happen to me? He returns this example. Verse 26, For who will declare the things from the beginning that we may also know the former things and say they are true? There is no one who foretells or hears your words. I will give Zion the power to rule and I shall comfort Jerusalem in the way. For I looked and there was no one from the nations or from their idols to declare it to me. If I should ask them where they are from, they would not answer me. For they are the ones who made you, so you think, and in vain they are leading you astray. So, this isn't just the end of idolatry in Israel. This is the end of idolatry for the whole world. This is going to prove once and for all who is a God and who isn't.
Okay. Now, chapter 42. I don't know why. We talked about how this is the first servant song. We talked about this recent interpretation that, that the servant is, is Israel. I'm going to depart a moment from the Orthodox study. You've seen I have sort of a love-hate relationship with the Orthodox study Bible and Isaiah because of the ventriloquists and the donkey centaurs and the, <laughs> the other strange things. Okay. This is what this is what the, uh, the original text says. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Okay? That's what the original text says. That's a pretty literal translation. Here is what the Orthodox Study Bible chose to publish. Jacob is my servant. I will help him. Israel is my chosen. My soul accepts him. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Okay. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Justice with <laughs> Well, justice. It's justice in the Greek, it's more judgment in the Hebrew. <laughs> That's. Basically, the uh, the Greek, <laughs> the original Greek, and as I said, the, the the only real difference in the in the Hebrew and Aramaic is that it has judgment instead of justice. But those two words, the word mishpat in uh, in Aramaic, and the word dikaios, which is justice in in Greek. Even though those are two different words in English, they, they're used to translate each other most of the time. So they, they mean roughly the same. So, for reasons unknown to me, the Orthodox Study Bible has chosen to go with the weird modern Jewish interpretation of this passage <laughs> rather, than the, rather than the, you know, actual Christian and most of history Jewish interpretation of this passage. And they just did it with this verse. They didn't go through the whole, like they didn't go through this whole passage and do that. The rest of the passage is actually pretty much pretty right on. Just this first verse, right? So, but in the original, right, you have right, God versus His servant, okay, His servant. We also call His chosen one. Literally, the Greek is elect. The one he's chosen is one. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. So, and, and so this lends itself to me, <laughs> right, to that messianic interpretation. This is a him, right? This is a person. Uh, a person upon whom God will place his spirit. The Old Testament so far, what have we seen in terms of God placing his spirit? It's God in the Old Testament. I'm not talking about Pentecost. The Pentecost. But in the Old Testament, has God ever placed his spirit on a whole bunch of people? He's placed it on one or two as individuals. Individuals? Yes. Right? Like David. And certain. The prophets. In the historical context, things that right. were needed to be raised right. up. Yes. Moses, yes. <laughs> right? He places his spirit on, right? Um, and there's a, there's a period, or there's that, that passage in Numbers where God takes a portion of his spirit that he's placed on Moses and temporarily gives it to the other elders of Israel. And then sort of takes it back. But we don't see God, right? Now we read the prophecies about Pentecost, right? That there's going to be this change, that there will come a day when God's going to pour in a spirit of God. Right. Whatever. But 
Here are the Old Testament. Right? If God's talking about, here's this person whom I'm going to send and I'm going to put my spirit upon them, that's always individuals. Right? Right. And that lines up with the other prophecies we've seen about the Messiah. Starting all the way back in Deuteronomy, where God said he was going to send another prophet like Moses to lead the people. Right? So all these prophecies fits right in with that. Right? The Spurman said to me, doesn't seem to work as well if we take the, again, I don't know why the next day about that, but um, if we take that idea that this is talking about the whole people of Israel at the time Isaiah is speaking, right? especially since at the time Isaiah is speaking, ten of the tribes just got wiped out of existence. Right? So, are we talking about Judah now? Well, okay, Judah. God have a Pentecost on Judah and then send them to all nations? No. Right? He did. <laughs> right? So this only happens, I mean, regardless of whether we want to be generic and say the Messiah, this only happens in Christ. It's only happens in Christ. His his justice, his judgment going out to all nations only happens if the Holy Spirit comes through Christ. Christ says, you know, when I leave, I will send the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. Okay. Not to mention, as we've been seeing in chapter 40 and 41, we're talking about this event of theophany, right, during which the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. Right? So at that moment, quite literally, the Father puts, <laughs> places his spirit upon the Son. Right? Upon Christ. In terms of fulfillment. Yeah? Theological question. <clears throat> Alright, Pentecost is pouring out of the Spirit upon the Lord, upon the people. Okay? That is just one event that does not mean Spirit of the Lord is continually poured out, or is it poured out continuously? You see what I'm saying? Right. I'm saying that we're being selective here. We're saying, okay, those at Pentecost went out to all mankind, the Spirit. But yet you look at it and you can and it's just the apostles. The Spirit came down upon them. Not upon the church. Well, right, not the mass. Who were not part of the church, yeah. Yeah, who were not part of the church and did not come down upon them because they were able to understand all of the languages right. of the different people in Jerusalem. At that but time. then, once they come, once they come into the, into the church, they receive the Holy Spirit as well. So we receive the Holy Spirit coming into the church. Right. And that's what's happening in the sacrament of chrismation. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. No. It's... But see, that's what. See, this is this is a, the pattern we're following. Is the pattern we see in the Book of Acts next year. Towards the, the end of next year, we get here. But in the Book of Acts, remember they find they find that old disciple of Saint John the Baptist, right? Who had been a follower of Saint John the Baptist, but hadn't heard about Christ. So he'd been baptized by St. John. Right? But he didn't know about Christ, and so he hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And so rather than going and baptizing him again, they come and they lay hands on him for him to receive the Holy Spirit. And he comes into the he comes into the fullness of the church. That's the pattern we follow with with converts who have already been baptized. Orthodox Church. Don't baptize you again. Well, let's give you the sacrament of preservation represents is receiving the Holy Spirit that brings you into the fullness of the church. However much of the church you've been in so far, you don't get a verdict about that. But you're now coming into the fullness. Oh. Alright, then the second question that goes with that is also 
come into the presence of the Holy Spirit, do you not then, as a Christian, come into the gifts and the operation of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, if we have, because I often wonder sometimes the gifts of the Spirit of healing and sin. Well, we'll get into that first turn. Probably around the beginning of 2017. I'm here now. So, <laughs> sometime around February 2017. And I'm going to say this on the tape. We'll see how well I'm calling this. <laughs> February 2017. I will return to this and answer Mr. Bill's question. When we are in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> well, I'm guesstimating. Still got some, we still got some Old Testament. Then we got four Gospels, Acts, Romans. Then we're into First Corinthians. So I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. So I'm, well, we, we'll start to get into it in Acts a little bit with Pentecost. Okay. So enough said about verse one. And my apologies to the publishers of the Orthodox Study Bible, but I I don't know what you're thinking there. And donkey centaur. That's all I have to say. Donkey Center. That were responsible Well, and it was every book was different people. Yeah, every book was different people and different proofreaders and different. So I don't know who it was who did Isaiah. And they're probably not listening to this. And if they are, they probably don't care what I think. But <laughs> and I'll, I'll probably I'll probably see them at the next clergy symposium and they'll rough me up on them the parking lot of the village. Okay, chapter 42, verse 2. Going back to the Orthodox study Bible. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard outside. A bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench. But he will bring forth judgment and truth. He will shine forth and not be broken until he establishes judgment in the earth. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Again, we got a few things there. You know. In, in whose name will the Gentiles hope? Right. That makes sense to me. Is that being is the nation of Israel makes sense to me? <laughs> to anybody? Right? First of all, it's singular his. <laughs> So this is talking about a this is talking about a person. It's talking again, again about through him the the truth of God and the worship of God going out to the Gentiles, going out to all the nations. Among our Jewish friends who want to take that interpretation that the servant is is Israel, do we see any of them going out and trying to bring their worship worship of their God to us Gentiles? I mean, while I find the Jehovah's Witnesses somewhat annoying early in the morning, at least, you know, they're practicing what they preach, right? (laughs) You know, I don't know that I want Jewish people banging on my door, but but at least it would be consistent, right? But but so that that just isn't there, right? Even the people who take this interpretation, they kind of stop after verse one, right? (laughs) I'm blacklisted by several groups. Our address is blacklisted by several groups. You can watch them cross the street. It's kind of a yeah. Yeah. Um, But the the other piece here, the other piece here that's important, and that's important when we when we look at Christ, is how he brings. Whether you want to translate that judgment or justice, right? How he brings justice to the whole world. Because what's going to be our big problem when we run into the Gospels in terms of the Jews accepting Christ, Jesus as the Messiah? Accepting Jesus as the Messiah. It's going to be that they're expecting a Messiah who's going to come in and overthrow the Romans. Right? Both of those revolutions, right, the one that gets the temple destroyed, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, gets Jerusalem destroyed, are started by guys who showed up claiming to be the Messiah got an army together and went and attacked the Romans. Right? That's what they're expecting in terms of a Messiah. But how is the Messiah described here? The way he brings justice is how? Gently. Gently. 
<laughs> Quietly. Right? He's not going to break a bruised reed. Right? When it's already bent, you know, it's half broken already. He's not going to come up and snap it. Right? Gently. Peacefully. Right? So this is telling us he's going to come in the exact opposite way. We're going to see in the future servant songs, they're going to talk about him suffering. Not about him conquering, about him suffering. So this is something to keep in mind here. This is, because that's the last verse. That's the end of what's called the first servant song. How is he characterized here in this verse one? The Lord is chosen. He comes, he brings justice to the whole world, not just to the, the Israelites. And he does it gently. He does it peacefully. He does it without violence. Well, just as a commentary, we, we sometimes in the West think of justice as somebody getting their just uh, deserves. So Revenge. Just, Revenge. Yeah. yeah. And that's not justice because we forget the word compassion, that none should be lost. And also, in our legal society, of restoring them back Society. Yeah. That has always been uh, in, in tension in America with those who quote unquote justice, you know, has been done. No, it has not. It's just been a small part of what justice is. We yeah. forget the part of forgiveness, we forget the part of mercy, we forget the part of compassion, which our laws come from the Bible. Okay? Yeah. And looking at it can just not forget. Yeah, our understanding of what justice is, even today in Western society, is not based on Christ. Our idea of justice is mostly violent. It's retribution. And dollar bills. And I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you back. Well, with dollar bills, it's it's you know you damaged me monetarily, so now I'm going to take you for every penny I can get. get. Yeah. Right. It's it's all. Retribution. I was listening to, I happened to be listening to, I didn't plan on this, but <laughs> I was listening to, uh, I was listening to a story on, a, on an NPR show this afternoon. There was an African American man talking about how over the course of the last 50 years, he's elderly now, over the course of the last 50 years, just by inviting them to come talk to him, right, starting with the grand wizard of his state, he has a whole closet full of clan members. These hardened Ku Klux Klan members have given him after they left the clan. Because he started out, 50 years ago, he invited the Grand Wizard of his state. Everyone told him he was crazy, that the guy was going to kill him. <laughs> invited him to come to his office just to interview him. Not for anything. Just to interview him. He just sat and talked to him. He just said, what do you believe? What do you believe? The guy showed up with a gun. <laughs> so what do you believe? He sat there with just a tape and he just talked about what he believed. And you invited him back and he talked, and he just sat and listened. You know, all the hateful stuff, all the, you know, okay, why do you believe that? Okay, well, why do you believe that? He was talking to him and ended up becoming friends with him. He ended up leaving the clan. And now he's had dozens, dozens of times Real justice, real victory is when you make your enemy your friend. And he talked about how much heat he's gotten from the NAACP. <laughs> I tell you, how can you sit down with these people? And he says back to them, how many people have you gotten to leave the claim? <laughs> because, because what's he done? He's restored those people. Those people who had this hate, right, this twisted, messed up, violent, you know, doctrine in their heads. All this hate and violence. He has through just befriending them, just being kind to them, listening to them. Right? He showed them a different way to live with people in the world. And so they have been healed. They found repentance. And so, that's the kind of justice we're talking about here. Christ doesn't come and give all the sinners what they deserve. Thank God. <laughs> 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 he 
He doesn't come and give them all what they got coming to them. Right? He comes and he turns sinners into saints. That's how he establishes justice. And so we need to, we need to, I think, even as a society, even culturally, start rethinking our notions of what of what justice is. To be more about, you know, saving a person. Right? Bringing a person back from whatever dark place they're in. You know, instead of giving them what we think they've got coming. Yeah. And it usually doesn't. It usually just hardens them and whatever. Verse 5. Thus says the Lord God who made heaven and established it, who made firm the earth and the things in it, and who gives breath to the people in it, and spirit to those who walk on it. So God is sort of establishing his credentials to speak. <laughs> right? Who's about to talk? The Lord God. Well, who's he? He's the one who made you alive. <laughs> right? He's the one who put breath in your lungs. He's the one who put you on this earth. Okay? He's now got something to say to you. That God. I, the Lord God, called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will strengthen you and give you as the covenant of a race as the light of the Gentiles to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners who are bound and those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord God. This is my name. I will not give my glory to another nor my praise to carved images. Behold, things from of old came to pass and new things I will declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. So who's God talking to? I say no. <laughs> well, to everybody. And here's, here's why I say no. I say this is God talking to his servant. And here's why. Here's why. Second half of verse 6. I will strengthen you, give you as the covenant of a race. Right? So I'm going to make you a covenant for a race. The race being the Jews. Right? There's a covenant to the Jews and it's the light of the Gentiles. Right? Now what do you mean? What St. Simeon puts that? He says, the light to the Gentiles and the glory of my people is there. Right? Those are the two categories. Well, what does Christ say when he, when he, when he breaks the bread at the Last Supper? And then when he offers the, the cup? This is the new covenant in my blood. Right. So Christ is a new covenant. There's a new covenant in Christ with God's people. Superseding the old one in Moses. Right. So I'll make you a covenant to my people. You're going to be a new covenant and the light to the Gentiles, meaning I'm going to bring them into this covenant too. So he's telling them now, before he even gets there, this is the covenant. Say to Jesus. Right. Yeah. To Christ, the Messiah. Yeah. Right. And so, right in verse 7, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners who are bound, and those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Right. Remember what St. John later on, he's in prison with Herod, he says, Are you the one? Or is it another? And Jesus says, Well, what do you see? The blind see. <laughs> right? right? So, this is the sign that he's that person. And then notice the last part. I am the Lord God. I will not share my glory with another with carved images. <coughs> right? So who does that mean the Messiah is? He's not someone other than God. Right? This is the Father talking to the Son. Right? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Right? We don't have idols anymore because Christ has manifested the true God on this earth. Right? We've seen God. We don't need to try to make images, some kind of representation of, of Him. He's revealed Himself to us. Right? That's why the icon of Christ can't be an idol. It's the opposite of an idol. <laughs> because of this right here. 
It's the opposite of an idol. An idol is us attempting to make God. An icon right? is not. Whereas the icon of Christ is God revealing how God has revealed Himself to us. Right? So it's the destruction of idols. That's why there will never need to be another idol. And that's why in, in Christian homes, Christian homes throughout the Roman Empire, they got rid of all their household gods, right? All the little statues and all the little that they had at the hearth, they got rid of all their household gods and replaced it with the icon of Christ. Starting already in the period of the Book of Acts. Okay, my question is this. Jesus himself in the uh, temple reads this scripture yep. and he says today it's fulfilled he makes the statement and he sits down that means it's finished I'm here yep. if you are Sanhedrin or that's if he isn't then that's blasphemy right here and now right. is it not? it was not unclear to them that he was claiming to be the Messiah Yes, and, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 he, and he does this, you know. Christ was not unclear about it. He was very clear that he was claiming to be the Messiah. Yes. So either he was or he wasn't. Yes, and you think <laughs> you know, that, that, that action would be taken then as heresy, would it not? Well, there were attempts. I mean, as we read in the Gospels, and as we'll see here, we're going to start doing the Gospels here toward the end of this year. Um we're going to see all the way through, you know, it's constantly saying, and they began to <laughs> you know, discuss how they could kill him. Yes. You know, and there are a couple of attempts. Remember, they try to throw him off a cliff, and he gets away. And why was the last question say by Caiaphas? Why did he say, I adjure you? Why did he say that to the very last, and then begin at the first, and you wouldn't even need false witnesses? I mean, to fulfill the prophecy, I <laughs> but then to go through that because of the, of the, of the Passover and the time constraints of the right. Jews at that time to say, or, I adjure. Well, because someone, someone showing up and claiming to be the Messiah, someone could still argue, well, I think he is the Messiah. Right? <laughs> and he was and there were some of the Sanhedrin, like Nicodemus, who believed he was. And, and but Jesus, said, was that, was but Jesus said, that said thou hast spoken the truth. Yeah, and yeah but there was other people at the same time. Like he Jesus. said, he said last. Yes, Caiaphas. Yeah, yeah. That was his last resort because if they could have just convicted him of, you know, get two people, they just needed two witnesses, right? Yeah. To come in and agree and both say he said some blasphemous thing, they could have convicted him and, okay, a trumped up charges. But they kept everybody who came in had a different made up story, <laughs> so they couldn't get two people to agree. And so that's when Caiaphas says, "Okay, well, I'll get him to claim to be the Messiah publicly," knowing that he had at least most of the. <laughs> but you see, back here he did when Jesus was in There was also a. Oh yeah. Yeah. But see, there was also a political element in that because at the time that trial before Caiaphas was happening was the Passover. Yeah. So there were the huge crowds in Jerusalem. Right? And there had been, I believe it was five years before that, Christ actually makes reference to it. About five years before that, there had been Passover riots. There had been rioting in Jerusalem. And Pilate's response to that, his governor, had been to grab 150 random Jews and crucify them along all the roads leading to Jerusalem. And Christ refers to that. He talks about those whose blood uh, Pilate mingled with the sacrifice. Who at the time of the sacrifice of Passover, who we executed. Right, just to make a point. <laughs> just to say when you're coming to this town, don't cause trouble. But, right? So, so there, was that, there was that political tension too, which is what eventually happens at the trial before Pilate. Is he's responsible to Caesar to keep the peace. So if he's got riots every couple of years getting out of control, that's what actually ended up happening. That's the end of the, a lot of people don't know from the Roman records. But Pilate, several years after Christ's death and resurrection, as we know from the destruction of the temple and everything, the riots continued. He couldn't keep control of it, so he was recalled to Rome next year. Yeah, 
was a good keeper of bees. He didn't, didn't do his job. <laughs> so that's why he was so ruthless. Because it was his head if he didn't keep the bees. Right? They said another governor said, you keep the bees. <laughs> and so that's why it escalated to, okay, you guys can't. We're going to take your temple. Right? We'll take away the, then you won't have any more of these pilgrimages and there won't be any more reasons for <laughs> Your temple. Temple and then when there were still problems, okay, we'll take out the whole city. <laughs> right? Then you'll have nothing. And then <laughs> we'll have to worry about it. But yeah, so that was that was part of it too, right? Was if Caiaphas could then go to Pilate and say, Hey, this guy is coming here claiming he's the king, which is what he claims, right? They say he, he's claiming he's the king of the Jews. And he's gonna start he's gonna start an insurrection. Against Caesar, you're gonna have another riot on your hands. Then that's why you God better, just says there's no other God but Caesar. Yeah. That he, he's giving, we will not cause. Right. He's trying Christ. to manipulate Pilate into We're saying, not have any yeah. riots. if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Uh, right. So he's trying to play it. That's how he was trying to play it. Okay. So verse ten. Sing to the Lord a new song, you his realm. Glorify his name from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and sail on it, you coastlands and you who inhabit it. Be glad, O desert, and its villages, the homesteads and those inhabiting Kedar. Those who dwell in Petra shall be glad. They shall shout from the tops of the mountains. They will give glory to God and declare his virtues in the coastlands. The Lord God of power shall go forth and crush war. He shall stir up his zeal and cry out against his enemies with strength. I held my peace, and I will not always be silent and restrain myself. Now I will be steadfast like a woman in labor. I shall amaze and dry up together. I'll make the rivers into coastlands and dry up marsh meadows. I'll bring the blind by a way they did not know, and will cause them to tread paths they have not known. I will turn darkness into light for them and make crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. But they turn back, you be greatly ashamed who, trusted in, who trust in carved images who say to the molded images, You are our gods. Hear you deaf, and look up, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servants, or deaf but those who rule over them? The servants of God are blind. You often see, but do not take heed. Your ears were opened, but you do not listen. The Lord God wished to show His righteousness and to magnify His praise. But I saw the people robbed and plundered, for there was a snare in the secret chambers everywhere, and in the houses at the same time where they hid them. They became as plunder, and there was no one to rescue the prey, and no one who said, Restore them. Who among you will give ear to these things? Who will listen and hear what is coming? Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to those who plunder him? Was it not God against whom they sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, nor heed his law. So he brought upon them the fury of his wrath, and war overpowered them. They set them on fire all around, yet none of them knew or took it to heart. Okay, so there's a couple things going on here. First there's this contrast between the servant who we've just been talking about and these servants plural. Right? These servants plural and those who rule over them. Referring to the wealthy, the powerful and at this point Judah. Right? Those who are ruling over his people now. Right? Between the Messiah as king and the current king. <laughs> Right, it is officials of the court and the prophets and the, and the and the priests that while they're blind, while they're blind and leading in the wrong direction, right, the Messiah who's going to come will be able to see and will enlighten the people. So there's that contrast. The other point that's being made is, as we just said, the Messiah comes and what? He's quiet. He's peaceful. He's gentle. Right. But we also need to remember, you know, it talks about crushing war, but then in verse 13, he shall stir up his zeal and cry out against his enemies with strength. I held my peace, and I will not always be silent and restrain myself. Meaning, there's going to come a time, right? There's going to be this time of reconciliation when the Messiah comes. But that time is not going to go on forever. It's like a pregnant woman in labor, right? There's a time and then that time comes. And when that time comes, 
then there is going to be judgment. Then there's going to be judgment of that other kind. There's going to be judgment where those who have continued in sinfulness pass this time of reconciliation. Those who have refused to repent, those who have refused to come back, when they're going to receive judgment in the fire he's talking about. He talks about Israel. He uses Israel as an example. He gave them a long time. Came to them again and again, sent them prophets, repent, turn back, repent, turn back, repent, turn back. Over and over again over this time. Eventually that time came to an end. And so there's coming this time of reconciliation, of comfort, of restoration, but that time isn't going to go on forever. So today is, you know, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of repentance. Right? Seek it while it may be found is what it's getting at there. So this is, the, this is again a place where we see sort of the first and second coming of Christ. But the first coming of Christ, his appearance, begins this era of reconciliation and consolation. But then that eventually, that's going to come to an end, and then there's going to be judgment. Okay. We've run fairly long. So we'll go ahead and stop here, even though we've only gotten through three chapters. Yeah, we're <laughs> Thank you for your patience. So, um.